Good morning. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Because when we see, because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. God who 
Lord save us. Let's sing that together. Hosanna, Hosanna. Please have a seat. Good morning, Mountain View family. How are you today? Great. Isn't the beautiful spring weather that we're enjoying here? Hey, uh, I first want to say happy Palm Sunday. We're so glad you cho chose to join us today. Um, as I've been reading through the New Testament, it reminds me of the goodness of God that Jesus fulfilled over 300 very specific prophecies. I mean, it is amazing how trustworthy God's word is and how we can rest in the goodness of God and revealing that to us. I remember as a young Christian uh, trying to really understand it, if I believed what I was reading in these verses. And there's a book called Science Speaks that these Christian professors went together, got together and, and calculated mathematically what the statistical probability of Jesus fulfilling this number of prophecies or this number of prophecies and what that might look like to us. And the first one that they did was if he fulfilled just eight specific prophecies, you could take the entire state of Texas, fill it with two feet of silver dollars and mark just one of them. Let's say we color it red and send a man to walk through the state of Texas blindfolded and to pull that one red silver dollar. That is the statistical probability of Jesus fulfilling just eight prophecies, but he fulfilled 300 of them. And so we are so blessed to have God's word in our lives. Amen? Amen. Children, you are dismissed. You can head off to your classes. Youth, we are blessed to have you with us today. Uh, if you have your communication sheets, let's quickly run through those together. What is happening at our church this week? Monday, 10 a.m., we have the ladies' morning study with Nancy Ross and Cindy Jenkins. At 6.30 p.m., we have the ladies' evening study with Naomi Karstadt. Yes, <laughs> some cheers for that. Awesome. Uh, uh, Tuesday, 6 p.m., we have Dive Into the Sunday Message on the east side with the Shones. Yes. <laughs> Great opportunity for small group studies. That's a blessing. Uh, Wednesday, we have all our midweek activities going on. We have the kids with Savannah, Pastor Derek, and the youth, as well as the Revelation study continuing on with Pastor Nathaniel. Yes. <laughs> uh, Thursday, 6 p.m., we have uh, the Better Man Study with Brother Todd. And then at 6.30 p.m., we have the Abide Young Adults Group. Woo! Yes. The OG Screamer is here, okay, you guys? The original. Uh, and then we have the uh, West Side Small Group Study with the Blooms at 6.30 p.m. as well. Uh, Saturday, 10 a.m., we have the Haderach Messianic Shabbat Fellowship with Pastor Jay. And um, the special uh, messages that we have here is uh, Operation Christmas Child. We're continuing to uh, collect the plush, small uh, stuffed animal type toys. Well, we have the boxes out in the entryway. Is that where the... Okay, so opportunity for, again, for us again to be working towards our goal of packing all those boxes in November. Uh, we have the starting, port, starting point April 15th, Monday, with Pastor Nathaniel. Again, this is an opportunity for those that are new to the church to learn more about the history of the church, the DNA of our church, and what makes us Mountain View, um, as well as getting to spend some time with Pastor Nathaniel. And then next Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we, can, we have more of these cards printed and available for you. Yes. All of Christianity hinges on the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we want to make sure that everybody hears the good news that Christ came to redeem us so that we could be called sons and daughters. Amen? Amen. Uh, so take those cards, invite your friends and family, and join us. Um, if you are visiting for the first time at the bottom of the communication sheet, there's a little tear-off that says, let's get acquainted. It gives you an opportunity to tell us a little bit about yourself and allows us to reach back to you and uh, just see how we can help you in your walk with the Lord. As well as the old timers know that that's how we take our prayer requests. You fill these out, drop them in the slots on the side wall here, and we'll gather them and be praying for you this week as you need that. Um, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you for uh, your faithfulness and goodness, God. God, we thank you that you did not leave us hanging, that you provided your word that we could know you. You provided your spirit that dwells in us, that gives us the ability to recognize all you are and all that you've done for us. 
Lord, we thank you for the fellowship of the saints that we could gather together each and every Sunday to celebrate the good news that Jesus has come to satisfy the penalty of sin. Lord, we pray that you would move in our midst today, that everything that we do would bring you glory, honor, and praise, that you would speak in and through the message, that we would hear your voice loudly and be changed by it. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.
Let's sing or praise the name. Lord is good. I'm going to lift, I'm going to pray, God, we are so thankful for you. We are thankful for what you have done and that you, you love us, that you chose the cross, you willingly chose the cross. You are God and Lord of all and you chose that. And because of that, we can be redeemed, we can be saints. You are worthy of all praise, Lord. And just acoustic and our voices, let's sing that chorus together, giving Christ the glory he deserves.
Amen. Hey, take a moment and shake someone's hand. You got one minute. All right. As the psalmist says in Psalm 133, verse 1, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen? I mean, what a beautiful picture. And it just puts a smile on our Father's face when he sees brethren, he sees his children united in the faith to come and to worship him, to honor him to lift up his son, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen? Amen. So church, here we are. We are um, continuing on in the life of the Messiah. And of course, today we're going to be talking about uh, his death, burial. And next Sunday, obviously, we're going to be dealing with the resurrection. But just a quick recap of what we've gone through as we've talked about the life of the Messiah, beginning, beginning with uh, uh, the first week of this month, we talked about his birth, his bar mitzvah. Again, I, I can never overlook that as we know that he was just as human as we are, and uh, he went through those, those same things that a young child would go through, a, 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 a boy would go through, a Jewish boy in the custom and the culture of that day and having a bar mitzvah. And then, of course, as he's growing up and he's getting ready for his earthly ministry, we talked about his baptism. And then we talked about the battle as he's led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And so last week we talked about his boys. He called his boys. He called that group of young men to go and, and to make uh, disciples of all the worlds as he made them fishers of men. And we talked about the blessing. So as he was teaching uh, the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes and uh, a message uh, that had never been heard because you consider the, the uh, crowd of that day and the religious culture of that day as he talked about blessed are ye. Then we talked about uh, the boldness that he had and how he just didn't hold back, especially for those that were the so-called teachers and religious leaders of that day. He was bold and he shared with them what they were doing. They totally misunderstood the love of God, totally misunderstood the Torah and what God was wanting to have them teach. And so he was bold in letting them know that. Then, of course, he, we talked about the burden as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane getting ready for what we are going to be celebrating as he's getting ready to go to the cross and die for the sin of the world. And, of course, dealing with that after the burden, he was betrayed by a friend, betrayed by one of his own. And so what we're going to be dealing with today, church, as we look to our text for today, we're going to talk about uh, his death uh, and his burial. John chapter 19, beginning at verse 31, we read, Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, 
when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. And so when we think about that, we think about the scriptures, we think about everything that as we talked about his, his life, it was all fulfilled. It was all about fulfilling prophecy, fulfilling the scriptures. As we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to what? The scriptures, the Old Testament. And that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So throughout the ministry of the Messiah, we talk about what prophecy was being fulfilled. As Brother Michael Lavatai shared with us, all the prophecies that he fulfilled. And there's still yet more to come as we talk about the book of Revelation on Wednesday night, all of that eventually is going to come to fruition. And I'm so thankful that we have that spoiler alert called the book of Revelation. So what we're going to be talking about today is the brutality. So we ended up last week as he was being betrayed, and after he was betrayed, he was arrested, and they took hold of him. And they beat him. And it was brutal. In Matthew chapter 26, we're going to pick it up in verse 57. Those who had seized Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. But Peter was following him at a distance as far as the country courtyard of the high priest and entered in and sat down with the officers to see the outcome. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. So they're trying to find folk to lie on him, to bring a false testimony against him. They did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. But later on, two came forward and said, this man stated, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. That was blasphemy to them. But as we know, he was talking about his body, not the building or the temple. The high priest stood, stood up and said to him, do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, I love this. You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his robe and said, he has blasphemed. What further need do we have of witnesses? Behold, you have now heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they answered, he deserves death. He deserves to die. And here's what they did. 
They spat in his face, beat him with their fists, and others slapped him. Now, you talk about taking it too far. But they just didn't beat him. It was brutal. It was torture. And they said, prophesy to us, you Christ, you Messiah. Who is the one who hit you? If you are the Messiah, if you are who you said you are, say you are, prophesy which one of us is hitting you. And as they continue to beat him, bam, who was it that did it? Bam, who was it that did it? Prophesy if you are the Messiah, which one of us hit you? The prophet Isaiah, and I chose the complete Jewish Bible version to give you a picture of what was going on when they were beating him. The prophet Isaiah had wrote about that many years before it even happened. See how my servant will succeed. He will be raised up, exalted, highly honored. Just as many were appalled at him. Because he was so disfigured that he didn't even seem human and simply no longer looked like a man. That's how badly he was beaten. That he was disfigured. He didn't even look like a man. They had beaten him so badly. The brutality of what he had gone through before going to the cross, before being nailed to the cross, they had beaten him, tortured him, scourged him. In fact, it was our diseases he bore. It's because of our sins that he went through that kind of brutality. Our pains from which he suffered, yet we regarded him as punished, stricken, afflicted by God. He went through that for us, for all of us. In chapter 53 of Isaiah, but he was wounded because of our crimes. He was crushed because of our sins. The disciplining that makes us whole fell on him. And by his bruises, by his stripes, as some virgins read, we are what? We're healed. We're made whole because of the brutality that he endured for us. Which brings us to the benevolence. He went through that because of what we read in John 3.16. For God so loved the world. That's how much God loves us, that he allowed his son to be brutally beaten, disfigured for us. He so loved the world that they were spitting on his son. The very men that were pounding him and pounding him, he died for them. He died for us. And you think that there is never anything that you've done that God won't forgive? God has forgiven all sin because his son died for all. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should, shall not perish but have eternal life. The benevolence of God the Father. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for who? The ungodly. 
He died for the sick. He died for the sinner. As he shared in one, one, one moment where he says uh, uh, a healthy person, they don't need, they don't need a physician. It's those that are sick that need, that need healing. He died for the ungodly. What a benevolent God. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. So as I used to think that before God can accept me, I got to get myself right. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if you're hesitating thinking that, well, I got to get right before I can come to God. I got to do this before I can come to God. No, you come as you are because as we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Come as you are. Because God is so benevolent. Now we come to the moment. Dealing with his death. And his burial. Matthew chapter 27, verse 45, beginning there, he says, Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. Understanding now, he had been disfigured. He was brutally beaten. But they didn't stop there. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was at that moment he's taking on the sin of the world. Every sin is poured out on him. And God being a holy God, God being a just God, even as his son was boring, taking on the sin of the world, could not look upon his own son. And there was that moment of separation that Jesus felt where he cried out, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there when they heard it began saying, this man is calling for Elijah. Elijah. Immediately one of them ran, taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Let's stand back and see, is Elijah going to show up? Is Elijah going to come and save him? The Apostle John gives a more detailed account of what was going on. So in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, beginning at verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to, again, fulfill the Scripture, the Old Testament said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And Bible scholars, you know what that means. Paid in full. Your sin and my sin was paid in full. They use that word to telestai or telestai, however you want it to pronounce it. Paid in full. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Pastor Chuck Smith says, It's finished. God's work of redemption is complete. 
and you can receive the greatest benefits with the simplest act of faith, just believing. Not up on the big screen, but the Gospel of John, chapter 20. So the very next chapter, the last two verses of that chapter, the Apostle John said, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, that being the Gospel of John. But these are written, these being the signs or the miracles, if you study the Gospel of John, there are seven miracles that John wrote about. Seven miracles that prove that he was exactly who he said he was. Seven miracles that prove that he was the Mashiach the Son of God. And so John says there are many other signs he did in the presence of his disciples, which I didn't write in this book, but these are written. These seven signs are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and believing that you may have life in his name. John says, I wrote these so that you will know who he is. And if you know who he is, believe who he is, you will have life. Eternal life. In chapter 40 of John. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. He was buried. So he died, and he was buried. Again, as 1 Corinthians 15 said, according to the scriptures. But now here's what I love what Paul wrote in, the, in Romans chapter 6. And in Romans chapter 6, really Paul just gives us a beautiful picture of what his death and burial and resurrection means to us. And how that you and I can identify with his death, burial, and and resurrection. Now, Paul, before he got there, he had to clear some things up because understanding these were new believers, all they heard was the Torah, the law, the way that Judaism had been taught, and now they're talking about grace. No longer law, but grace. And it was saying that God is so gracious, God is so benevolent that even when you sin, God will forgive you of your sin. And unfortunately, the Gentiles were thinking that, well, the more I sin, the more grace I can receive. So Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Are you kidding me? May it never be. I love the King James Version. It says, God forbid. No, that's not what grace is all about. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? What a great question. What a profound question. If you say you've died to something, how can you continue to live in it? You say, I've died to self. I've denied self. How can you continue to live selfishly? Speaking of our identity, identifying with what he did, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? See, when you accepted his death, you believe that you died to self. You were baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death 
so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might also walk, how church? In newness of life. Amen? So, what a beautiful way to cross-reference that verse that we've shared since we started this series on the life of the Messiah. Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20 just really sums it all up as to what Romans chapter 6 was saying. If you've died to sin, don't continue to live in it. So Paul had to write to the church of Galatia and share that with them as well, where he says, I am what? Crucified with Christ. As he went to that cross, I went to the cross. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I what? I live. Just as he said in Romans 6, 4, to walk in newness of what? Life. If any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. Yet not I. It is not I that's living, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live presently, I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. See, as I live in this flesh, it is not the flesh that is dominating my life. It is the faith that I have in the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. So as we think about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. We identify with that. As he's called us. As he called his boys. Follow me. And your lives will change forever. You will never ever be the same. And if you've truly believed in him and followed him, you can too say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. What a testimony. What a blessing. And so church, as we conclude with this message for today, I, I, I believe God's timing is so perfect as we prepare for communion. As we deal with the death and burial. As we talked about the brutality. As we think about what he went through for us. Why? Because God is a loving God. He is not willing that any should perish. But that all might come to repentance. Father, thank you for this beautiful picture, a picture of brutality, yet, dear Lord, it was something that your son went through for us. You loved us so much that you gave your son to be brutally beaten, to die for the sin of the world. And Father, I pray that every soul that is seated today, every soul that is tuning in, if they've never come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, Father, I pray that they will want to know you in that personal, intimate way through your son. We're not talking about church attendance. We're not talking about because a loved one or a friend knows Jesus. We're not talking about knowing scripture. The devil believes. But Father, we're talking about knowing you, not knowing of you. 
but having a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. There's no other way. And Father, I pray that someone have not taken that step, that first step of salvation. Father, I pray that you would deal with them right where they are right now. Father, as I've prayed over every soul that is in this treasure chest that we have here on this platform, it's not a prop. There are names that families and friends have placed in there to pray for them. And, Father, as I've prayed and continue to pray for every name, every soul that is in that treasure chest, dear Lord, that they may come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. May you deal with them even right now, even those that are incarcerated. May your word touch them right now, right where they are, I pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. And so here we are. We have communion, a beautiful Sunday to do this. And of course, we, we normally do it on the last Sunday of the month, but being that next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, we figure we just do it this Sunday just to have this moment to remember what Jesus Christ did for us. And so if you'd like to just come right now, we have communion up front. We have it in the middle. And we also have gluten-free in the middle for those that want that. But as we're gathering together for communion, thank you, sweetheart. Let's think about these words, words that really tell a lot. So when you're taking communion, I would really encourage you to read that passage that I shared with you from the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapters 52 and 53. But Paul writing to the Corinthians said in chapter 11, Beginning at verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want you to remember the beating. I want you to remember my body that was broken. I want you to remember how my body was disfigured. Man, that's a terrible thing to, 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 to fathom, to think about, but I just want you to know what I did for you every time you break bread. Remember me. And after the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. A lot of blood was shed from his body. And every time you drink this cup, I want you to remember the blood that was shed. The body that was broken, beaten, brutally tortured, and the blood that was shed. I did it for you, and I want you to remember that. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Guys, I'm coming back. Just as every prophecy has been fulfilled, there is still a prophecy that I will fulfill. I am coming back. Amen. 
So Pastor Zach, brother, will you come and ask the Lord's blessings over this communion? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we were created in your image, created in the image of God, and sin made us to be irrecognizable. Hmm. The image that we were created in was marred. Lord, we thank you that you took upon that image, you took upon that frame, and became marred, irrecognizable as a man trading places with us, taking the penalty that was designed for us who were sinners. But Lord, your grace has purchased us and made us into new creations yes. where the old has passed away and all things are made new in Christ Jesus. We thank you for your redemption. We thank you for reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Lord, and as we take these elements, God, we examine ourselves before you. I pray yes. that you would reveal in us if there is any way in which we are not waging war against the flesh, Lord. I pray that we would be those that actively seek to walk in righteousness. Mm -hmm. Lord, and take upon that image that you have now so given to us as those who stand right in your sight. Yes, Lord. Thank you for the sufficiency of the grace of Jesus. Thank you for the blood that was shed and the body that was broken. Bless this time, we ask in the name of Jesus. And all God's people say, amen. 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 So church, let's stand together. As you hear me often say, not a ritual, not a check the box moment. This is important to him as often as you do this. You show forth my death till I come. Let's remember him. Wow, we finished in great time. A couple of minutes to spare. Yeah, so hey church, God bless you. I pray that when we leave here today, we be remembered and reminded how important it is that when it's all said and done, it's all about the gospel. Amen? So go and make disciples. Go and share the good news. Go and show that benevolence as our Father demonstrated toward us. Amen? God bless your church. Have a great day. Have a great week. Looking forward to Resurrection Sunday. God bless you. There's a name that can silence every fear. There's a love that embraces the heartache, the pain, and the tears. Through my faith and my doubting, I know one thing for sure. His word is unfailing, His promise secure. Don't know I'll stop yet.